Of course there is. Yeah, of course there is. Talk about that. Tell me what, what the anger is. What? What are you angry about? Jean-Michel Basquiat was just 27 years old when he died in 1988 from a heroin overdose. In the 30 years since his death, the prices of his art have climbed up. And in 2017, a Japanese billionaire bought the artist's untitled painting for $110.5 million, setting a new record for the highest price ever paid at an auction for an American artist's work. Today, everyone remains fascinated by Basquiat. His life is compelling, and his work is impossible to look away from. As one of the few black American painters to break through into international consciousness, he's been referenced a lot in hip-hop, from Kanye to Jay-Z to Nas. In many ways, Basquiat was more like a rock star than anything else. His rise to fame was extremely swift, and he enjoyed his celebrity status. He was charismatic, he was a ladies' man, and dated lots of women, including Madonna, and he loved to party. He received massive acclaim in just a few short years, and in 1983 he met one of his heroes, Andy Warhol, who would become his mentor and friend. Ultimately, Basquiat seemed like someone that had a lot of fun while he was around. He was deeply talented, and his art was always driven by his spirit. What are you angry about? I don't remember. In general, art is one aspect of life that is universal, and that goes back to the beginning of humanity. If you look at cavemen, they would paint on the walls to portray reality. Oftentimes they would depict animals, and these illustrations had to be obvious because humans back then were likely unable to talk. Before language, the only way to communicate an idea across space and time was through art, so art was absolutely a necessity. These cavemen also painted as a means to mark their place in the world. The picture you're looking at right here comes from Indonesia, and is over 39,000 years old, making it the oldest hand stencil known to science. When language was invented, the purpose of art shifted. It was less about articulating a rudimentary message, and more about capturing wealth, beauty, and religion. For example, you'd see art depicting a leader defeating an army, so in a way, art became a flex after writing. This continued until the skill level of artists became on par with photography before photos even exist. That's what Renaissance art did. It represented reality and humans' beauty. During this time, painting relied on fixed subjects, and was a process that took an extended amount of time to achieve a realistic result. The invention of the photograph in 1839 changed art forever. It liberated painting from its ties to realism. There was no more need for an artist to labor intensively to depict and record people or events. A photograph could do that in an instant. So the focus of painting shifts to abstraction and leaves the task of keeping visual records to the photographers. This is when you get impressionist artists like Van Gogh, where he decides, okay, I'm gonna paint what I feel when I see something. So we'd look at the sky and paint swirls and chose to emphasize the stars. I mean, he could draw a perfectly scientific tree, but it's not about that anymore. That's not interesting. Now it becomes capturing the essence of a subject. And then you go even a step further with Picasso and surrealist paintings, where he would take a person or object and dissect the subject. And I think a fascinating culture that comes later is graffiti, which kind of takes my quick, incomplete art history lesson full circle. Graffiti isn't merely about decoration, it's about relaying a message. It's about marking your presence and letting the world know that you were there. Jean-Michel Basquiat was born on December 22, 1960 in Brooklyn, New York, back when graffiti art was at its infancy. His father was born in Haiti, and his mother was a New York native of Puerto Rican descent. She had a strong interest in art and fashion, and she'd take him to the Brooklyn Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, and the Metropolitan Museum. Inspired by what he saw, Basquiat was drawing incessantly as a child, and he was informed by what he saw on the TV, comic books, and his neighborhood. At eight years old, Basquiat was playing in the street and got hit by a car and suffered severe internal injuries. He had to get his spleen removed, and while he recuperated, his mother gave him a copy of the medical textbook Grey's Anatomy, which is filled with anatomical drawings that would go on to influence his later work. 
That same year, Basquiat's family went through financial issues, initially caused by the cost of his hospital bills, and his parents split. His mother fell into a deep depression after the divorce and had to check into a mental hospital a little while later. Jean was forced to live with his father, who was incredibly harsh and would beat him. It's reported that one time he was beat so severely that he went to school the next day walking with a cane. Whenever he needed an escape, he would disappear into the crawl space beneath his staircase and cover it in drawings. Jean wasn't a fan of structured education and didn't like obedience. He moved between at least five different public schools. Eventually, in 1976, at the age of 15, he landed at the City as School, a refuge for gifted New York children who didn't respond well to traditional learning. It used the city's cultural institutions as classrooms and regularly gave its students subway tokens for rides to the Hayden Planetarium and MoMA. But he didn't last long there either. At his friend Al Diaz's graduation in 1977, he dumped a box of shaving cream on the principal's head as a dare. He didn't return for his last year of high school, but self-educated by visiting New York museums and creative hubs like Soho. There, his graffiti poetry signed with the moniker Samo, which stood for same old shit, began to show up on walls. Jean started Samo with his schoolmate Al Diaz. The pair was different from other decorative graffiti artists of the time. Their art was meant in part to be satire on corporations. Instead of pictures, Samo asked odd questions or made enigmatic philosophical declarations. What we did was complete, completely apart from the subway graffiti culture. It had nothing, the same old graffiti was, was almost a reaction to that. It was like, no, we're going to do something smart because we're smart guys and we want adults to read this. The same old tag was scattered all over lower Manhattan and drew a considerable amount of attention around New York. In a way, Samo went viral before virality was a thing. In December 1978, the duo appeared in an article in The Village Voice, which revealed their identities. And shortly after, Jean appeared on Glenn O'Brien's TV program, The TV Party. TV Party in the past has brought you some of the most significant commentators on graffiti in New York. Uh, but tonight, we're lucky enough to have with us uh, probably the most language-oriented of all graffiti artists in New York, Samo and his associate. Samo, Samo sorry. It's Mr. Samo. It's my personal secretary. Sorry, Mr. Samo. Do you write something different every time, or do you write the, uh, you know? I've written the same thing before, just... It all depends, you know, like how inspired I feel. This is around the time that Samo ended. Jean saw it as a vehicle. In a way, the graffiti was an advertisement for himself and he had his eyes on becoming a famous artist. And he was very uh, diligent in his, his um, climb to, to popularity and fame. He was, it was part of his, his master plan. It should be noted that during these early years, Basquiat was extremely poor. His diet at the time consisted of cheap red wine and 15 cent bags of Cheetos. I was determined not to go home again. But did you think I could be a bomb forever? Yeah, so I did, yeah. yeah? I didn't mean, I could be on, I thought I was going to be a bomb forever. Jean would jump from couch to couch and panhandle and sell hand-painted postcards to make a little money. One day, he saw famous artist Andy Warhol inside of a restaurant, so he walked right in, introduced himself, and proceeded to sell him one of his postcards. TV party host Glenn O'Brien asked then 19-year-old Jean to star in a movie he wrote called Downtown 81. The movie was abandoned in the mid-80s due to financial issues, and it got released 20 years later at the 2000 Cannes Film Festival. The movie is a hardly fictional look at New York City's dawn of the 80s art scene, where Jean plays a version of himself. He was homeless at the time of the movie, and slept in the production office during most of the shooting. The film production crew bought him canvases and paints to make paintings for the film. So all the paintings you see in this movie belonging to his character were done by him. After the movie, he moved in with then-girlfriend Suzanne Malik, who supported him financially. She paid the rent waitressing while he worked fanatically at home. Because he had no money for canvases, he painted on anything he could find, from doors and briefcases he found on the street, to permanent elements in their flat, like the fridge, the TV, walls, and floors. Every surface was covered. He even painted on her clothes. Later that year, when he was still 19, he received his first write-up in the art press. Then critic Jeffrey Deitch spotted his work in the Times Square show, calling his paintings a quote, knockout combination of de Kooning and subway spray paint. 
In February 1981, Jean was featured in the New York slash New Wave show at PS1, put on by Diego Cortez. Of more than 100 artists, he was the only one to be given a prominent space for paintings and showed more than 20 works in the final room of the show. Anina Nose, a gallery owner in Soho, saw his work and felt an immediate connection to it. She asked to represent him, but besides what he exhibited, he had no additional paintings. He needed money and a place to paint, so she offered up her gallery's basement storeroom as a studio, and he got to work. He worked several canvases at a time, dancing from one surface to the other. He could finish two or three paintings in a day. His work resonated with many in the art world who were eager to cast off the minimalist trend that dominated the late 60s and 70s. Basquiat became a pioneer in Expressionism. In March 1982, at the age of 21, Anina put on his first solo show, and it was a hit. Everything sold, and he made $200,000 in one night. Later that year, he became the youngest artist to exhibit at Documenta 7 in Kassel, Germany. So in an extremely short amount of time, Basquiat had become a star, and he had a strict regimen, work during the day and party at night. Downtown Manhattan became a melting pot of the arts at the end of the 1970s. The downtown crowd of the time consciously set out to be unpretentious, and the scene drew everyone from lawyers to local suburban punks. Clubs hosted DJs, live bands, performances, exhibitions, film screenings, and fashion shows. In the lower Manhattan underground scene, one club in particular became a staple, the Mud Club. For Jean, it was virtually a second home. It was the first nightclub in New York that also functioned as a gallery. Jean always loved smoking joints, but with the new steady stream of cash flowing in his pockets, he started to indulge heavily in cocaine and tried heroin, although it didn't initially affect his output. He described this time saying, quote, I had some money. I made the best paintings ever. I was completely reclusive, worked a lot, took a lot of drugs. So do you have a specific method of working? Do you have certain hours that you always work? Do you I, I just have to, I'm usually in front of the television. I have to have some source material around me, you know, to, uh, to like work what? with. You know, magazines, textbooks. You don't mind having a lot of people around too while you're painting too? I think I'd rather work alone more than anything. You know, I used to have assistants a lot mm -hmm. around me and then on days when they wouldn't come, it would be a lot more productive, you know? The first really major press for Jean-Michel happened in 1985, when the New York Times Magazine ran a cover story on Basquiat titled New Art, New Money. The tone of the article was both odd and suspicious. There were some critics at the time who weren't as hot on the artist. The art world, which is full of liberal left-wing types, was feeling that they, you know, they needed to make a bow in that direction. Uh, the disadvantaged, uh, minorities, and so on. His contribution to art is so minuscule as to be practically nil. About your, your, the story that you're always uh, being locked in the basement in order to paint, uh, that, that's just, um, just has a nasty edge to it, you know? I mean, I, I was never lo locked anywhere. I mean, if I was white, they would just say artist in residence rather than say all that other stuff. Most of my reviews have been more reviews on, 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 your personality. on my personality, yeah, more so than, than my work mostly. They're just racist, most of these people. As his star power increased and his paintings became more and more valuable, he became more distrustful of the press and his friends. He started to think that people were surrounding him for exploitative reasons. Go to a restaurant and they write about it in, in, in the post on page six, you know. I, know, I, try to, I like to try to, be, to remain a little, little reclusive, or a little reclusive and not be just and be out there, you know, just to, you know, to be to be brought up and to be brought down, you know, like they do to, do to most of them. Yeah, because sometimes they can tell on them, don't they? Well, they, they always do. I can't think of one big celebrity type person who they haven't done that to. They tell on you? Uh, here and there.
even though Basquiat was the darling of the art world. When he stepped out of that circle and away from those parties, he was still just a black man in the 80s living in New York City. Me, Jean, we came outside and we were gonna go downtown to have dinner. So Jean throws his hand up, you know, he's waiting for a cab. And one cab, two cab, three cab, four cab, five cabs like pass. And Jean would sometimes get mad because the cab would pass. He'd try to run up, like try to pull a door open. You fucker, you know, but you'd feel these moments like it was just a part of being black and living in new york city like these things happen you know what i'm saying race entered his work more explicitly he painted the ordeals and traumas black people in america faced his focus on black culture was atypical of artists at the time and his work helped bring attention to the lack of diversity in the art world i think there's a lot of people that are, that are, that are neglected in, in, in art i don't know if because it's, if it's who made the paintings or what but um I know, it's, I know black people never really portrayed realistically in, not, 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 or not even portrayed, I mean not even portrayed in modern art enough. Because of this, the black person became the protagonist in most of his paintings. The crown became one of Basquiat's most enduring motifs. In a way, it was a representation of his success. Basquiat, the king of the streets, had conquered the art world, and he chose to celebrate black kings because the world didn't. One afternoon, Swiss art dealer Bruno Bischofberger set up a lunch between Basquiat and Andy Warhol. Basquiat said he couldn't stay for lunch, disappeared, and came back one hour later with a portrait he drew of him and Andy. That lunch, their friendship began. So, uh, I understand uh, that you uh, hobnob with the hobnobs. <laughs> And you go to this club called Area. <laughs> Basquiat and Warhol were an unlikely pairing. It was the 80s cool kid with the king of pop art. Plenty of people speculated about the motives behind this unexpected friendship, and many thought the two were using each other for personal gain. Jean-Michel wanted to gain approval from the traditional art world and thought Warhol could help him get accepted. And Andy's art wasn't selling as well in the 80s, so he thought he needed Jean's new blood. Despite their agendas, the folks that were close to the pair speak of a genuine adoration and love between the two. They were remarkably close, and Andy loved Jean-Michel almost like a son. I hung out with him and Andy several times during that period when they were very close. Andy was really giving great advice. Andy would be like, Jean, did you do this? And he spoke to your mom, and did you blah, blah, blah. He'd go through this list of things, and Jean would be like, yep, yeah, 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 I did that, you know. So I was just like, okay, oh, wow, you know. The pair collaborated on huge pieces of unstretched canvas, some of them 10 by 20 feet. He, he would start most of the paintings. He would, put, he would start one of them, put some something very concrete or recognizable, you know, like a newspaper headline or a product logo, and then I would sort of deface it, and then, and then I would try to get him to work some more on it, you know, and then I would work more on it. I would try to get him to do at least two things, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, likes to, he likes to do just one hit, one hit, you know, and then, <laughs> and, and then have me do all the work on, after that. So did you have rules like you couldn't actually paint over his stuff, or...? No, 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 we used to paint over each other's stuff all the time. Yeah. The duo exhibited their work together in September 1985, when Warhol and Basquiat paintings opened at the Tony Shafrazi Gallery in Soho. However, the work was met with mostly negative reviews. Many of the critics claimed Warhol had used Basquiat to stay relevant. One New York Times critic wrote, quote, The collaboration looks like one of Warhol's manipulations. Basquiat, meanwhile, comes across as the all-too-willing accessory. It's not fully understood if Jean felt bad that he let Andy down, or if he believed the press, and that Andy was actually taking advantage of him. Either way, Basquiat left New York hurt and depressed. Tragically, the two would never make amends. Andy Warhol died last week. One week ago today, as he lay in a hospital bed following gallbladder surgery, Andy Warhol's heart stopped beating. His condition had been stable. No one had expected him to die. Jean was absolutely devastated that he never had a chance to repair their relationship, and he went downhill after that. There was no one who could replace Andy. He was the one person that always seemed to be able to bring Jean-Michel back from the edge. The drug habit that Basquiat developed to cope with being thrust into fame began to spiral out of control. Jean is quoted saying, They tell me the drugs are killing me, and I stop. And then they say my art is dead. 
His final show took place in New York City on April 1988. It often feels like many artists prophesized their future. The paintings in this show were dark and scary. In one painting, Basquiat scribbled man dies several times. He was in a bad frame of mind because he thought the press was going to get him, and he was upset with his relationship with his father, who never gave him the validation he so badly craved. I would say that I think that he would, he was a bit lonely. We were having lunch at the Odeon and Jean-Michel's dad was there with some businessmen. So he's like, ah, that's my dad over there. And he went up, he popped up and he bounced over and he was with his friends, which was us. And his dad was with his friends. He's like, hey dad, how you doing? Look, I'm, and I'm taking all my friends off the lunch. I'm successful, blah, blah, blah. And Jean-Michel came back with his tail between his legs. His dad kind of iced him. There was moments where I saw him. It just deflated him. Jean knew he had a drug problem and didn't want to die. So he took a trip to Hawaii to get clean, but returned to New York just a couple months later, at the end of June. Summer is a strange, you know, it's a motherfucker in New York. It's hot. It's very lonely and empty in the summer. On Friday, August 12, 1988, his late girlfriend Kelly Inman received a call from Kevin. Jean was going with him to a Run DMC concert that evening. She climbed the stairs to their upstairs bedroom, saw him sleeping, and decided not to disturb him. Kevin rang again three hours later, and she again climbed the stairs. This time, she found Jean unresponsive, lying in a pool of vomit. He died of a heroin overdose at the age of 27. The brilliant, intense life of a most remarkable artist, America's first truly important black painter, was over. He left behind over a thousand paintings and drawings. A lot of times the circumstances of someone's death can color their entire life, and that's unfortunate. Jean-Michel is often misunderstood because of the way he died. But when you look at the totality of his life, he was triumphant. He did more in his short life than most people will ever do. One of the real tragedies of both Warhol and Basquiat's death is that both could have been prevented. Andy had an incompetent nurse, and Jean did the classic thing that heroin addicts do who shoot up after a hiatus. He had no idea what his tolerance was anymore. The other real tragedy is that the duo wasted their healthy relationship because of some bullshit critics that were wrong. In hindsight, their paintings are considered really good, but critics of the time were unable to see the potential for what the art could be. Their feud wasn't personal. Their separation felt much more like a professional decision. Basquiat distanced himself to protect his image, and I imagine that's why it must have hurt him so much when Andy passed, because their fight was so superficial. It's a shame Basquiat didn't have support in a deeper sense, so he didn't get so lonely and confused. Today, around 30 years after his death, Basquiat seems as relevant as ever. You still see him appear in the news, but now it's usually about a collector buying his work for millions of dollars. Like in 2017 when his painting sold for a whopping $110.5 million. Or maybe you see him on your Instagram feed. Or hear about a fashion label like Supreme doing a collab with his estate. Or a brand like Off-White using his style as a reference point. Basquiat was ahead of his time, and his name and unique personal style have become frequent reference points in popular culture. Fellow Brooklyn native Jay-Z, for instance, famously compared himself to the artist in his 2013 song, Picasso Baby. There is a great quote by Picasso that goes, learn the rules like a pro, so you can break them like an artist. I think that's exactly what Basquiat was doing. He grew up going to New York's finest museums. He drew every day, he knew his art and art history, and he had an appreciation for it. But he took that knowledge and added his own flavor. He intentionally broke the rules. And maybe that's one of the secrets of life. You prepare like crazy, you learn the fundamentals, you learn everything you can about something. And when an opportunity comes your way, you throw all that information away and you make it your own. I think I most admire Basquiat's creative freedom. I tend to judge myself in the process of creation. When I'm writing and I misspell a word, I go back and fix it before I move on. When I'm drawing, I'm held back by wanting things to look perfect. But as cliche as it sounds, a lot of the best art comes out of the mishaps. It comes from the stumbles. Sometimes the stumbles are the magic. 
Basquiat didn't question himself. He painted because he had to. Whatever inspiration came his way, he channeled that into his canvas. Good art isn't just visual, rather it points a mirror in your face and addresses you as a viewer. What makes Jean's art so special is that it's never clear cut. It doesn't tell you how to feel. You have to look at his art and try and pull meaning for yourself. Thank you guys for making it to the end of the video. I hope you liked it. This was a really fun project for me, getting to learn about the art world, which is something I didn't know too much about prior to starting this. If you dig the video and wanna say hi, pop over to my Instagram at Jake Zeman and shoot me a message. I post music on there, talk about upcoming projects, and even do some funny lemonade reviews. If you are a fan of music, head over to my Spotify page. I've curated lots of playlists, including different artist packs for each of the musicians I've made videos on, from Tame Impala to Frank Ocean to Mac Miller. I have also curated mood playlists like a brand new trip pack and late night drive playlist. I also have one that is dedicated to all my favorite music of the moment, and I do update these playlists every single day, so check them out. Lastly, if you want to support my channel and rock some cool merch, visit jakezeman.com. I have custom designed artist stickers, some dad hats and t-shirts, and I'm really proud of everything on this website. I wear all this stuff myself, and it is all produced in a local SF shop. So check out that site. All of those links are in the bio. So that is it for me this time. These videos do take me a very long time, but I have several videos planned, so stay tuned. Much love.